right, we just finished a series called Freedom, Discovering the Divine You, and, and now we're going to go into something is how living in freedom every day. And this is what God wants to do in my life and your life. And what can happen is this, when you discover freedom, when you make a difference in your life, often there is a recoil to try to keep you bound in the past. And this is all about getting free of the past. Now, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be looking at the book of Galatians. And sometimes we do book studies and sometimes we do topical studies. And what we're going to be doing is a book study of the book of Galatians. And so what I want to encourage you to do is do this at home, is take your Bible, whether it's electronic or whatever, and read the book of Galatians. Now, if, if you can't understand when you open the Bible and read it well, there's some good modern translations that would do a good job. Uh, for those of you who struggle with the King James Version, as wonderful as it is, there's a new King James Version. A real easy one to read is NLT and other things like that. I want to encourage you. Uh, it's, it's translated from the Greek into more modern language. makes it easier. I want to encourage you to look at the book of Galatians and read it, become familiar with it. And so that's what we're going to be doing. And so what we're going to be doing is going to the foundations, a little bit of our faith. And let me explain to you a little bit what Galatians is about. Uh, if you want to open your Bibles and get ready for it, Galatians chapter 1. We're going to start verse 1 in a few moments. But the background of a Galatians is that Jesus died and rose again from the dead, and he sent his disciples out. About 45 years later or so, the apostle Paul is now an apostle. An apostle is just means one that is sent. And what he would do, along with the other apostles is they would go out and they would go to a community, they would preach the gospel, about Je gospel means good news, about Jesus Christ. They'd start a church, they'd be there for a period of time, they'd set up leaders at that church and then move on to the next place. And they'd train up leaders and they were just doing that all across uh, the, the Middle East and also the parts of Europe. And so that's what the Apostle Paul did. And the Apostle Paul went to Galatia area, which is by modern Turkey. And he started a church there and raised up leaders. And that's what he was doing. And epistles, by the way, what's an epistle? An epistle just means letter. And so what he would do, he'd start a church, and he can't FaceTime and email. So they would send the old-fashioned letters, and they'd take, it, they'd take it by a horse or wherever, and someone would, uh, he'd write it on parchment, and they'd bring it to the church area, and they would read it from church to church to church as instructions. And so the Apostle Paul started a great church in Galatia area, and now he's, been, now he's hearing stuff that's going on that's not too good. He's concerned about it. So he's now bringing them a letter of correction to help wrong, make right the wrongs that are taking place. And that's what's going on. So he's very much an entrepreneur in the faith, if you will, and that's what's happening. So let's go ahead and, and look at the scriptures, what would happen. And I uh, just wanted to say also that the, the church in Galatia got off to a great start. They found freedom in Christ. They were doing well. They got free of the past. And remember, this is a very pagan society. Something else I want to bring to your attention as well to help bring the context of this passage of Scripture alive is that there was a problem in the early church. I heard people say all the time, we need to get back to the early church. Well, the early church had its, its fair share of problems like we have today. Anytime you have people, you're going to have challenges. And what happened was, let me explain to you what happened. Prior to Jesus coming, the Jewish people were the chosen people, all right? And so they were used to separating themselves from the Gentiles. Gentiles would be people that are non-Jewish. Jesus came, and he died for all of mankind, including the Gentiles. So now what would happen? They go out and they preach the gospel, which is the good news of Jesus Christ. People give their lives to Christ, and all of a sudden, Gentiles, non-Jewish people, were coming in the church. And the Apostle Paul says, you know, this is all you have to do. And, and meanwhile, these people, wait a minute, we're, we're the real church. We're Jewish people. We, we were here before they were here. And how dare they come into church with a pair of jeans on? How dare they do this or the other? How dare they not to have a yarmulke on there? How dare they? I mean, they had all these things. And they have to go to Passover. They have to keep all these feasts. And when you do X, Y, and Z, then we'll accept you. And they had a hard time. There was an elitism. There was a favoritism. There was all kinds of stuff going on. So if you were a Gentile Christian, you're like all oh, those Gentile, dirty Gentile Christians. There was a lot of elitism in the church. It was a problem. In fact, the Apostle Paul preached against it. And here these people came back, and now they're saying, and imagine this, now they're saying you have to, um, well, let's go ahead and read it now in the Scripture. I brought a little context, and let's bring it, start to read it. We'll break it down a little bit. Galatians chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. Paul, an apostle, not for men, nor through men, but through Christ Jesus, and God the Father who raised them up from the dead. And all the brethren who are with me to the churches of Galatia, 
grace to you and peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil age according to the will of God and Father, to whom glory and forever and ever, amen, amen. So Christ has come, he's basically saying Christ came, all of us were full of sin, all of us were, had problems, and Christ came and died for us that we could have freedom with Christ. That's why he came. And he now begins, now he does all that, now he begins to bring up a problems that are in the church. That there's different brands of Christianity that are out there. You'll see it in a few moments. Galatians uh, chapter 1, verse 6 now. I marvel that you're turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ. Now, he says, you're turning away so soon. What is grace? Grace simply means unmerited favor. Grace is, if I give you, if I had the ability, I wish I had the ability to hand everyone in this church a million dollars. And if I did that and you received it, that would be grace. I got the grace of a million dollars in my hand. It was not something I, I did. I just received it. And so what he's saying here, he's saying, um, we're right here in verse 6, my marvel that you're turning away so soon, who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel. Do you know what gospel means? It means good news. That's what it means. We preach the gospel in this church. I mean, that's, that's like, <laughs> if you hear, I heard people say that, and they kind of, I oh, know, they do all that. And, well, first of all, it's like, we preach the good news. That's not good news if you're like, well, we believe in the gospel. Has anyone ever experienced that? I'm not only one. Okay, there's a few of you here. Okay. And they always have a little saliva that kind of makes its way. It's like, clear your throat. Please clear your throat. <laughs> you know, I, I, if you go to a church like that, praise God. We love you. Okay, here we go. But anyhow, <laughs> to a different gospel. What's that? Which is not another, but there are, some of, there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even when, listen, he says, people are coming and perverting the gospel. We said, by grace you've been saved. And you're coming and saying, you got to do X, Y, and Z. Then God will, will make you right. Do you see that? Let's just continue to read. And I'll break it down for us today. Uh, a little bit more about that. Here we go. Verse 7. Which is not another, but there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel. Take the good news. Make it bad news, Right? But even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you, then what we preach to you, let him be accursed. And I have said before, now I'll say it again, if anyone preaches any other gospel, good news to you, then what you have received, let him be accursed. Do you realize even an angel comes? Do you know that an angel came to a, a, a man in the Middle East by the name of Muhammad? Said this is a new way. Joseph Smith up in New York an angel came to him, supposedly, and gave him some golden Ray-Bans, and he was able then to read his secret things, came Mormonism. The Bible says, even if another person can let him be accursed. So that's part of it. But there was a gospel of Jesus Christ. You are saved by grace, not of yourself, lest anyone can boast. In other words, no one is good enough. Now, if imagine if you would, if I were to give you a teaspoon, and I would take you to the Long Island Sound, I said, I want you to empty the Long Island Sound with a teaspoon. You say, what, 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 are you, what are you, crazy? And then you come with a huge dump truck, and now you want to back in there and take out uh, 2,000 gallons at a time. Now, who's going to be able to do it? Whether you have something and pick up 2,000 gallons or a teaspoon, can anyone do it? Absolutely not. None of us are righteous, no, not even one. And I've talked to people that think, you know, the church is against everything. And I understand that. And that's not the spirit of Christ. That's the spirit of religion. And we're going to get into it in a few moments here. But the apostle Paul said, there's a problem going on here. You start off in grace. And now these Judaizers, and by the way, these folks, you have to understand, they, they knew the first five books of the Old Testament. A lot of these Jewish people memorized it. And they're saying, you need to do X, Y, and Z. So you can come to church, you gotta, you got to have your dress out to here, you, you, you can't do this, you can't do the other, you can't watch radar movies, you can't watch um, the, new, um, the new Fuller House, it's really bad, it is, and, <laughs> and you can't vote for it, and they have all these things that you're supposed to do in order to be a believer and be a Christian. If you don't do these things, then you're not good enough. And so now, Christianity became a big to-do list. i got to check this list off, 
And once I meet all this criteria, then I can be good enough. So you go to church. Imagine this. We're having a membership class today. And what they used to do back in that, those days, that this is what they were asking. This is what was going on. They were asking people to become circumcised. Now, don't ask me to explain what circumcision is. Okay? Don't Google it now. Look at it later on. But let's just say when a baby is born, on the eighth day of the Jewish culture, they would circumcise a child, okay? Now, imagine today, we happen to have a membership class here today, Church 101. You're welcome to come. You get to find out about Cornerstone Church. You're welcome to come. We have a few extra spots today. At 101, right to your right, there's a conference room there. And, you, and this is true. This is happening, okay? We're going to have this today. We're going to serve you lunch. You're welcome to come. Now, imagine, we said, and we're also going to have a circumcision station, so in order to join Cornerstone Church, you have to be circumcised. I know if it was me, I was like, honey, I'm going to go to the car. You go ahead and go to the class. There's no way, right? And that's what they were asking them to do. That's extreme, right? So you had to do all these things in order to be accepted by the community. And it, it, just, it just broke the purpose of that Christ came to break the power of sin and death on the cross. So there's two Gospels. So the Jewish Christians went and said, you're going to have to do this and the other. All these Old Testament things. And you know what the truth is? Often religion, you do mechanisms and things in order to reach God's approval, right? i got to do this, this, and the other. I have to uh, pray three times a day, five times a day. I have to go to Mecca. I have to go to church. I have to get baptized. And should I be sprinkled or dunked or dunked or sprinkled? Or should I go Dunkin' Donuts? Which one should I do? You know, you're trying to figure out all these things that you have to do. And, and often the Methodists and Presbyterians, they started off good. But after a period of time, it all becomes about ritual. And even here at the church, it'd be the same thing. Do you speak in tongues? Then you're not of God. You know, and we start, your spirit, can you prophesy? Or can, can, you, can you know all your scripture? Can you tell me all the books of the Bible? And it gets all about the things you're supposed to do. And so Christianity no longer is a relationship. It is a set of expectations that you have to measure up to. And frankly, if that was the case, no one could do it. I've known people that said, you know, I grew up in a church where I had to do all these things. I said, forget it. I can't do it. I'm not as smart. I don't have a great marriage like you have. I don't have the brains you have. I can't memorize all those scriptures. You guys are quoting scriptures all the time. And when you pray, it's something that sounds like it should be published. How am I supposed to pray? I can't. Forget it. I want to succeed at something. I'm not going to church. And that's a spirit of religion. Spirit of religion is a bunch of rules and regulations. And that's not what God would have for us. You know, I have, to be, I have to be honest with you this morning that I struggled at a period of my life with church. There was a point in time in my life where I used to drive by a church and get a nauseous feeling in my, oh, I don't want to go there. Oh, gosh. You see, I went to college in, a, in the Bible Belt buckle. I was right in the first rung. I mean, I was in a place called Springfield, Missouri. It's a great place. I used to call it Springfield Misery, but it was a nice place. It is. Nice place to raise your kids. But the, the headquarters of the Assemblies of God was there. We had a, a, the Fundamentalist Baptist headquarters there. You had churches on every street corner. You think that might be a good thing? And then there was like four or five Christian radio stations. And everywhere you went, it was church, 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 church. Rules, rules, rules. It was all about what you had to do. And people would be upset with each other. And they criticized. The Baptists would criticize the Pentecostals. The Pentecostals would criticize the Baptists. And then you had, it was a mess. It was like, oh, my Lord. And I got so sick of it. And I went to college. And they told me all these things I had to do. So guess what I did? I grew a mullet. <laughs> grew a mullet. I shouldn't really say too much. I had a black leather jacket, black boots, and I was like the fast-talking, fast-walking New Yorker. And so I got sick of it for a period of time. Imagine me with long hair. I didn't really have any hair anymore. <laughs> and, and, and so I just struggled with it. In fact, uh, I, I'm gonna, I shouldn't say it for my kids, but anyhow, I, I had a speech class. Imagine that. And, and, and the same as it got a very strong no drinking allowed, and I understand that, okay? And guess what my speech was on? This is my premise. If Jesus drank, then I'm going to drink. That was my sermon. To, that, was my, that was my speech. And I got, so I got the class was upset. Uh, ended up going to the dean. I got in trouble. I said, listen, the Bible says that Jesus made, that's his first miracle. If Jesus drank, then I'm going to drink. And so, except, but I never got drunk in my life. But I, I, I was like this pushing the envelope, right? And so, um, don't, please don't do that. When you, okay? Okay. But I got tired of all the legalism. It made me sick. And by the way, um, you know, the Bible does talk about these types of things, such as alcohol. It says, do not be drunk with wine, right? And, and if it's a problem for you, don't do it. But I'm just saying the Bible does not say you cannot. 
you know, and I proved it wrong, and I, and I did that in the class. I get myself in trouble, and you know, all that kind of thing. I, I pushed the envelope with everything. Talent show, I started playing some rock song. Okay, I'm, I'll stop. Where I'm at. But I got sick of it. Then I went to graduate school, and I almost gave up on the whole thing. I really did. I got sick of all the religious thing. You have to do all these things, and I hated it. And, but I knew God was real, you see. And so some of the most rudest, the most judgmental people I know in the world are, Christ, are so-called Christians. And a lot of people reject Jesus Christ, not because of Jesus Christ, because of how we present him. We present him when we're angry. You're gonna go to hell. I mean, what? <laughs> why would I want to go to a place where the guy, you're gonna go to hell. It's like a political campaign where they're slamming their foot in the fist on the desk. They're gonna burn in hell and turn or burn. And, 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 and it seems like they're really excited that people are gonna go to hell. I mean, they're really excited. And they Smoke cigarettes. Meanwhile, the guy's 600 pounds. <laughs> Just had a Twinkie before he preached. A hello. A hypocritical. You know, I saw all that, and, you know, and I struggled with that. And so if, if you struggle with church, welcome to the club. I struggled too. In fact, that's why I'm a pastor. <laughs> I couldn't stand the nonsense I saw. I'm like, you know what? I'm not going to be that way. And I began to realize that it isn't about what you do. It's about, it's about what has been done for you. Amen. Now, you have that, you have that, that extreme. Then you have the other extreme. All you need is grace. La da 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 da. All you need is grace, grace. All you need is grace. I've never smoked pot in my life. But they might as well smoke pot. Because it's all about, hey man, it's all about grace. You can do what you want. Jesus died on the cross, bro. You know, it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> Go ahead, man. Go ahead and, you know, go ahead and don't have to get married. Do what you want, baby. You know, it's all about grace. You're judgmental. So we got these legalistic people, and then you got these grace, like, hippies on the other side. And the, both of them are dead wrong. The truth of the matter is that God loves us so much that he sent Jesus Christ. And so I, I got so sick of it. And even today, I hate all the legalism. It, it, you know, it's, it's really not good. So I want to show you something this morning that will help us all. It's found in the first book of the Old Testament. It's called Genesis. It's not just a rock band, okay? Genesis, all the way to the maps, to, to Revelation, there is uh, the second story of the Bible deals with an issue, and the end book of the Bible talks about the same thing. And so I'm going to bring you to your attention, please. So there's some good news some good news. And the Bible gives a metaphor of two trees, and it would happen literally would happen as well. So if you could please turn to your Bibles, I'd appreciate that, or your phones, or whatever you have. Uh, Genesis chapter 2, verse 8. All right. Now, the first thing God did was he created the heavens and the earth, then he created the garden and all that, all right? And now we're getting to the story about Adam and Eve. Verse 8. Then the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man who he had formed. And out of the ground the Lord God made every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life, I want you to pay attention to that, the tree of life was also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and the evil. There's these two big, the two big trees, the tree of life, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. My friends, these two types of trees, we come into contact every single day. You and I make a decision. There's two trees you can pluck the fruit off of. One brings life, and one brings death, condemnation, and separation, and misery. And so we're going to talk about that here in a few moments. This is what happened. Now we jump to um, verse 16. And the Lord commanded the man, saying... Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat. Now, the garden was huge. Huge. I mean, all kinds of wonderful things in that garden. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in it, the day you eat it, you shall surely die. So very, very clear. You're going to have everything else here. Just do not take those cookies on the bottom shelf. And, of course, what does me want to do? You want to go for the thing you're not supposed to do. And, uh, and that's what he did. So verse, um, verse you know, next chapter, Genesis 3. Now here comes the serpent, okay? And he's still the same today, still very cunning. But the serpent was more cunning than any other beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, has God indeed said, 
You shall not eat of every tree in the garden. I don't know. Did God say that? No. What did God say? You may eat of any tree except one. The enemy comes and takes one prohibition and makes it over everything. Doesn't God say, you can't have any fun at all in life. You're supposed to be miserable and wait for the second coming. Is that what it says? No. It says, be holy for I am holy. Do you know what, it, by the way, do you know what, it, when I say the word holy, what do you guys think of? Holy, holy, holy. I'm, so, what do you, I'm being holy. No. You know what holy means? Holy means being whole. Holy means perfect in every capacity. That's who God is. So when God says, be holy, you know what he's saying? Be whole. I don't know about you, but I could sure use some more wholeness in me. I got a lot of holes in my life. And holiness fills the holes with completeness. That's what true holiness is. We make holiness like, you got to be holy. Well, I don't want to be like, if that's holy, I don't want nothing to do with it. Jesus never acted that way, did he? And so the serpent says, yeah, as he said, you're not supposed to eat of any fruit of the, in the garden. No, God never said that. So she says to him, the woman said in verse 2, said to the serpent, we may eat the fruit of the trees in the, of the garden. She had that right. But the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you should not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Okay, so here's a prohibition that God has set up for your own good. And what does the enemy say? The serpent said to the woman, you shall not surely die, for God knows that in the day you will eat, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God. Knowing good and evil. He's not asking her to go party. He's not asking her to rebel. He's saying, you can become more like God. That's a noble thing to do, to be more like God, right? You eat this, you're going to be like God. You're going to know the difference between good and bad. That's a good thing. You'll be like God. And so often religion does that. You can do these things, and you can become like God. So it sounds like a good thing. And this is the thing about rules and regulations. Rules and regulations, if I can keep them, I can, I can get a certain merit, can I? If I don't, this is what I've noticed. I've noticed people are really critical of things they don't have troubles with, right? They're against everything because they had no trouble with it. But I ask them to get rid of pride, they'll have trouble with it. And so what will happen is with all these rules and regulations, I can control my relationship with God based upon the rules I keep. The problem is some of us can keep a lot of rules, some of you can't, and God doesn't look at that totally, okay? So you can control your godliness. Verse 6. So when the women saw that the tree was good for food, it was pleasant to the eyes. It's pleasant to know the truth. I need to know what's going on. What's going on in their marriage? What's going on with that person? What, what did they do? What? What happened? What did the boss do? What did they say? I got to know. Why do you want to know? First, I want to pray for them. Yeah, sure. If you, have an, if you have an insatiable appetite to find out information, I got to know what's happening. I'm an inquiring mind. Inquiring minds have to know. That's not of God. That's like, I want to know what's going on. I want to know something about that. I want to know information. And it says here, Pleasant to the eyes, and tree was desirable to make one rise. She took of its fruit, and she ate. She also gave it to her husband, who was a bonehead, with her, and he ate. That's not in there. That's my translation. <laughs> the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig trees together and made themselves coverings. I know in all the pictures I grew up with, Eve had a long, long enough hair just to cover the body parts, right? It wasn't all about that. What happened was they lost God's presence. They lost the life of Christ, came off of them. And now they felt naked. Why? Because you and I are created to be covered by God's presence. Without God's presence, you feel naked. And when you feel naked, you try to find other clothes to cover yourself. The problem is everything else is, is, is going to, like fig leaves, they will, they will spoil the only way, we were designed for God, by God, to be with God. And if you don't have God on you, you have something else. God said, on me, I need legalism on me. You see that? And this is what happened. They feel they were naked. Now, there's two gospels we live. We have two ways. We want to live in the tree of life, which is life-giving, or the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The whole experience of the church has been about that. How am I going to become godly? I become godly by doing this and the other. I got to go to church on, I got to go to church on Sunday. I got to come. I got to serve. Now the pastor said he need help with the children's ministry. I guess I got to do that now too. Oh, I got to read my Bible every day. I got to fast. I got to do this. I got to do the other. I got to memorize scripture. I got to be able to pray like Mormon Vincent Peale. I, I have to be able to have wonderful things. You don't even know who he is, do you? Okay, I'm sorry. I got to be as happy as Joel Osteen to be a Christian. <laughs> How am I going to become godly? What's my approach? And in Christianity, we tend to go back to religion. Why? We want to control. Now, I'm going to say something. It might offend a few of you, and I'll get over it. 
This is what I have found. I have found that people have rejected the power of the Holy Spirit in a church today. Not because the Bible says, the Bible says, do not forbid speaking in tongues, and these signs and wonders shall follow those who believe my name. The Bible is very clear about the signs and wonders of today. But you know what the problem is? The problem is we can't control it. I can't control who God heals and who he doesn't heal. So since I cannot control it, it must not exist. And so whole denominations were built on saying, well, God doesn't heal today. Why? Because we can't control it. And that's the truth of the matter. It really is. And, there, and in our church, we, pray, we can't control God, but we ask God to do stuff. And so it's uncomfortable not to be able to control. But you know what? I'd rather trust God. I'd rather trust God for healing and be sick than be well not believe in it. I'm serious. Because God is a God that loves. God's a God that's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so we want to control God. We want to have these rules and regulations. I want to read a certain amount. Instead of focusing on who he is, you focus on what you have to do. Now, this is the, this is the deal. When you come close to Christ, you can focus on what you have to do or you can focus on what's been done. That's the answer. I have to do this. I have to do the other. And you know what I'm talking about? I can't do all that. I remember sitting there. I can't have a marriage like that person has. I don't have the person's hair, their teeth, or perfect eyesight. <laughs> I, can't, I can't be that person. I, I, I just can't measure up to who this person is. Forget about it. It's too difficult. I don't want to be a failure. And that's a spirit of religion, which says you have to do this, 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 and then you'll be good enough. But it's not about what you do. It's about what Jesus has done. Christianity, in its true sense of the world, is that Jesus did it for us. He gave, remember, it's going back to the Long Island Sound. It's trying, to, it's trying to bail out the Long Island Sound or the ocean with a teaspoon. Whether you have a 30,000 gallon uh, thing you take out of the uh, Long Island Sound or have a teaspoon, none of us can do it. And so Jesus did it for us. This is the difference, okay? Imagine if you will. Imagine if you, I, I'd say religion's like being a rowboat. I hate rowboats. You sit there and you, ugh, and you sit there and you go nowhere and you have to do it and it's hard or hard. That's religion. You keep rowing all by yourself. Or living in the life of Jesus Christ and the Spirit is like being on a sailboat. Okay, you still have to do some work, but you know what you got to do? You put the sail up of faith. You find the wind. You sense the wind. The wind propels you. And by the wind, it propels you. Without the wind, you cannot move. But with the wind, you can. It's about letting God lead our lives, being in partnership with not just, I gotta make it happen. I gotta read my Bible. I gotta read my Bible. I gotta pray. I'm not good enough. Oh, I'm supposed to read the Bible through in a year. I haven't done it in six months. Uh, what am I supposed to do now? They ask me. Listen, if you're reading through the Bible in a year and you fell behind, so what? Stop. Just pick up the day where it is today. Today's what? Um, the sixth. Start your Bible reading plan today if you're doing that. Just don't try to keep the legalistic aspects. And so what happens is you focus on the external instead of the internal. And that's what turned me off so much growing up. My, my parents were always great, by the way. I'm talking about the other religious stuff. Mom and Dad, if you're watching, I know you are. I, you guys were extraordinary great. And that, the reason why I'm a Christian today is because my mom and dad were with a real deal. But all around them, I didn't see it. Okay? You got that? Okay. <laughs> all right. And I mean that sincerely. So you can focus on the external. And how about this? You know, i got to read my Bible three times a day and this and the other. And, you know, um, the, there's a scripture verse. Oops. Excuse me here. I'm having a little trouble with my, uh, I'm going to get it right back here in my notes. Um, two Gospels. Here we go. There we go. Thank you very much. Um, for example, we're, we have children, and we love our children dearly. You ever hear the statement, silence is golden? but duct tape is silver, okay? So <laughs> if I try to get our kids, you can't do this, you can't do that, it's easy to say that. It takes no effort to nag. I, I, I didn't understand it when I was a kid, but now nagging is easy. It just rolls off the tongue. You know, it's like an opera. It's, it's so easy to sing it. It's just like, do this, do the other. Blah, 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 you know, and if we keep, doing, keep on doing that, the kids are like, I can do nothing right. But you know what's more important to us? We want to have our kids' hearts. We want our kids to know that God loves them, that he has a purpose for their, their life, that they're going to be excellent young adults, they're going to be incredible, make a difference in the world, that they have God's blessing upon them. And we want to let them know, listen, there's a better way for you. The reason we want you to study and read and, and do all these things is because we believe in you, and you're going to be a great young adult one day, and we love you. We, we believe in you. Now, do this, do the other, put your room. I was like, please, I'm not going to do anything. The more you nag... 
the less I'm going to, the more I'm going to run away. And so it isn't about that. I want their hearts. You know what the Bible says in John 14, 15? If you love me, keep my commandments. Okay? Now, I'm going to read that scripture verse in two different ways. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to read it through the knowledge of good and evil. Okay? Here it goes. Eric, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. I expect you up at the crack of dawn before the thing rooster crows. you got to be up, and you got to read your Bible. You better memorize the Bible so you can quote more than the guy across town. And I expect you to keep your eyes clear and pure. Make sure you do this and the other. Read the Bible. Okay, do that. I okay, I have to do all these things. If you love me, you'll do the dishes. If you love me, you'll do the other. And it's all about if. It's all about if I do this, then that means I love the person. You see that? That's living in the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It's all about rules and regulations, and it's all about the externals and not the internals. Now, reading it from the tree of life is this. Eric, if you love me, it will be easy for you to obey my commandments because you'll love me. You'll want to follow me. You want to please me. You want to do what's right. There's a big difference, folks. If I, if I say to my wife, and you know, if I take my wife out to, it's okay, it's, it's Valentine's Day, I gotta buy her a card. I gotta buy her a box of chocolates. You never know what's in a box of chocolates, as, as our dear theologian Forrest Gump said. So I buy her chocolates, and I give her, here, honey, here you go, here's this, here the other, and then here. But you know what makes our relationship work? It isn't just doing stuff, though, it does help. <laughs> it does help. <laughs> But my wife and I, will go out, we'll have breakfast together, and we'll look across the table at each other, and I look at her eyes, and she looks at mine, get a little shy, I love it, you know, and it's like it, it gets the romance thing going, and, and we have another baby on the way. No, I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding, I am just <laughs> kidding, we do not have another baby on the way. <laughs> Let me stop, <laughs> sorry honey, uh, but... But when we, when we spend time cultivating our romance and love for each other, it's easy. then I want to I please my wife. But the moment it all becomes about things I have to do is the moment it starts to die. The relationship's all about do, 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 do. And you don't want your life to be do, do. <laughs> right? You want your life to be about God. You want it to be about life. And so this is so simple. It's so scandalous. This is what Jesus says. I just read it yesterday in, this, in the scriptures, reading through the Bible in a year. You know what it said? This is what you have to do. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, and your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. If you do that, everything else works out. You treat your children right, you treat your boss right, you treat yourself right, because it's real simple. Love God and love each other. How simple is that? It's scandalous, isn't it? So that's what all God asks us to do. It's real simple. And so, yes, I've talked to people. You mean God would accept me? And, and my, my, I, I talked to somebody that had a relationship that was completely, you'd flee floored if you knew this relationship this person had. And instead of going after the relationship that was improper, I said, Jesus loves you. What about this? We can deal with that later on. Right now, God wants your heart. Your behavior is secondary. God wants your heart. If God gets your heart, your behavior will change. It's that simple. So if you have a hard time obeying God and staying pure and all that, there's a problem with your heart. You need to fall more in love with Jesus Christ. Now, is there grit? Is there discipline? Absolutely. But the standpoint of your discipline must come from a standpoint of love and not rules. Rules without relationship equals rebellion. Rules without relationship equals rebellion. So if you're trying to do all these things, and so... The Apostle Paul's saying here, get away from all the rules and regulations. It's by grace you've been saved. Who bewitched you to go back to all these things? And so we want to walk in the tree of the knowledge of, of life, not the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You see, we don't want that. Let me say something else about knowledge. Knowledge is, can be a weapon. Knowledge is a weapon. The enemy, it's, they call the devil the accuser of the brother. He takes the truth and he points it and he cuts us up. You know what truth is? Real truth? Real truth is knowledge married with God's love. That's truth. Knowledge is not truth. Biblical truth is knowledge married with love. You shall know the what? Knowledge? And the knowledge will make you true? No. You shall know the truth. And the truth will make you free. So, how do we do it? And you know what Jesus says about the Pharisees and Sadducees and, and uh, in John 5, 39? 
He says the following, you search the scriptures for in it you think you have eternal life. But these are the things which testify of me. But you're not willing to come to me that you may have life. They were more interested in keeping the rules and the regulations. Why? Because I can control my relationship with God by doing rules and regulations. To trust God for someone's healing, I have to rely upon God. I'd rather have good doctrine instead. I'd rather parse the Greek verb in the proper way. I'd rather have good exegesis. And you know, I've seen, I've seen so many people, we have the truth. I hate when I see that. You know what? I'm sure that Cornerstone Church has some blind spots. I'm not the end all, get all. I, I'm not the uh, pinnacle of Christianity. There's some other people that probably know more than I do. I need, you know, let's thank God for the other folks that are out there. You should be sprinkled. They should be dunked. Whatever. You know, I, I mean, am I going to argue about that? I want to follow God. I want to have love. I, let me show you a more excellent way. If I have not love, I'm, I'm a vers and I have not love, I'm nothing. And so really, it's all about Jesus' love. And that's life. Rules and regulations are important, yes. But they have to come from the foundation of love. It's like building your house. If you build your house on rules and regulations, you're like the foolish man who built his house upon the sand. But if you build your rules and regulations upon love, it's going to be solid. Everything in rules and regulations has to be coming from love. Not just in that itself. You see, our focus is not getting God's approval because we can't get his approval. Our focus is on God's love. He loves me so much that I cannot help but love him back. Your view of God determines how you receive God. If you think God is, you're never good enough. You're not good enough, no. You have an A plus, why didn't you get extra credit? You know, uh, where are you going? You're going to Princeton? You should go to Yale, it's better. I mean, it's always something else you got to do. And it isn't about that. Focus on love. And this is what it says. Um, how about this? Does this happen to you? How about on the way to church today? You, just, you couldn't get the kids, you couldn't get people ready. And you're so frustrated. Come on, we'll be late. Oh, come on, hurry up. And then you, and then you let out an exp expletive like some of our political candidates do. Okay? <laughs> and you're driving to church. You're upset. You're angry. Ah! And come to hey hey good to see you. praise praise God good to see you and, and you're listening and you're like and all of a sudden they worship here my arms open wide don't lift your hands you're a hypocrite don't dare do that you're not good enough to come to church you don't even come to the praise service because everyone else is going to see you they're going to say why well, he's not lifting his hands or she's kind of upset and you're not good enough to raise your hands you're a scum bucket look what you did this past week look at the things you looked at and the things you did you're not good enough. I'm not good enough here, arms open. I'm going to go get a cup of coffee. I'm going to walk out. And you feel you're not good enough to come to church. Well, look at this other person over here. Look at that. The kids are like, they come out of a family circle magazine. I mean, they all are beautiful. They smell good. I mean, even when the kids go to the bathroom, it smells good. It's amazing. These people are extraordinary. I can't be like that. I can't measure that. And I've heard people say, and, and I, you know, and I, I, someone told me this uh, recently, and I don't like it. Well, we're the mature Christians. Those are baby Christians. Wah, 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 baby Christians. We're the strong ones. That's ridiculous. Let's not do that. They're young Christians. We want to see them do well, right? Oh, those, those kids are babies. Or I love babies. Babies are awesome. I don't love them that much. But you keep having them. We're doing fine. But, and so I can't worship today because I'm not good enough. You know the Bible says? There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. The enemy would come and say, hey, you're not good enough. And God said, that's right, I'm good enough. Receive what I've done, and you'll be all right. Amen. First John 5, 3. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not a burden. The reason his commandments are not a burden is because we're in love with Christ. We want to please God. We want to please him. I want to please God. I want to please my wife. I want to please my wife. I love my wife. Are we perfect? No. But you know what? I, I'm, I'm proud to say, in a good way, that we don't let stuff go on more than two years. I mean, we've been doing fun. <laughs> Just kidding. We don't let stuff go on beyond a day. We don't. I would say within two hours, we solve every kind of conflict. We, we make up. We're sorry. We don't hold on to it. Because I'm like, you know what? I'm not perfect. You're not perfect. But she's a lot more perfect than I am. We love each other, right? And we make a choice. We're going to love you, right, honey? We're not perfect, you can ask our children. But we don't let things go on for days and days and days. You left the toilet seat up again. You know, it's in, you know, it's in that kind of thing. 
Um, and the Bible says in 1 John 5, 12, he who has the Son has life. And he who does not have the Son does not have life. Rules and regulations without love is dangerous. It's a weapon. I've seen Christianity cut people up more than a knife fight in the middle of New York City. I'm telling you right now, rules without love is dangerous. God did not come to cut us up. He came to save us. Remember, all you need is not, no, it's not that, nor is all legalism. God loves us so much, and the way you get closer to God is very simple. Go after God. Well, how do I, how do I love God more? How do I do that? Okay, this is the bottom line, really. You gotta stay and grow in love with God. That's the key. Stay and grow in love with God. That's why we worship. I don't like worship. Well, you know what? Have you ever, ever hugged your, if you're married, you, or you hug, right? Hopefully. You have kids, you have affection. What we're doing in worship is saying, God, I love you. And when you do that and you worship him, it helps foster a love relationship, what makes it easier to do. Serving God should be a delight. Church should be a delight. Reading the Bible. It's like, like I gotta read my Bible today. I didn't do it again today. God's upset with me. What happened? I didn't read my Bible today. I didn't pray or anything. He doesn't love me anymore. No, I read like this. You know what? When I don't read my Bible, I'm like, oh, I miss my time with God. Man, I love when I'm with God. It's like saying I miss not being at the beach and laying in the sun in the middle of winter. I love doing that, right? You can't tell from my complexion, but nevertheless. Uh, and so I love, doing, I love spending time with God. So if I don't spend time with God, I feel like, oh, I miss my time with God. I miss not reading his word. I don't have, I used to feel guilty. I don't feel guilty. Now I just feel, I feel like, oh, I miss it. I miss that time, God. I want to be with God. I'm such a better person when I'm with God. Believe me, my wife can always tell me, you didn't spend time with God today, did you? And she didn't say it legalistically. She could tell. Because the perfume of worship is not coming off of me. Not perfume, cologne. One word perfume. <laughs> Matthew 7, 21 to 23. Not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, is going to heaven, but he who does the will of my Father. Just because you do this, 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 and the other rules, it's not about that. It's about loving God. And so that's all part of it. I'm going to ask uh, that the ushers get ready to pass out the elements. One focuses on external duty. That's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, while the tree of life focuses on internal love for God, internal desire. 1 John 5, 3. We've mentioned that already. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments. And listen to this. And his commandments are not burdensome. God gives his commandments to us because he loves us. He wants us to flourish. He wants us to do well. And when he does give a prohibition, the prohibition so we can, his prohibition is so we can expand the mission that he's called us to do. The reason why God didn't tell us to do something, not to limit our fun, but to give us more fun. He wants us to have more joy, more peace. Here at 1 John 5.12 says this. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil will kill your marriage. It will kill a church. It will kill a country. Do you see what's going on with political candidates? Again, you didn't do this. You didn't do that. I mean, that's not, that's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. What's love? Love builds up, believes all things, hopes all things. How do we change? How do we change? I say it all the time. There's no change without breaking. We have to break with the way we used to do things. If you like to constantly, you didn't do this, you didn't do that. Listen, we come to church on the morning and said, it's too hot in here. I don't like it. It's too loud. And if it's too loud, we'll, we'll tell us, we'll help you out, okay? But I don't like the coffee. It's too strong. And we come here looking for it to criticize. How was it? Eh, it was all right. The worship was good, but the pastor was boring. That's not of God. Let me tell you right now. That's not, <laughs> okay. <laughs> but, um, but I want to encourage you. What you should do instead is come to church and say, can you believe they wore that to church? He had tattoos and piercings. So what? Get over it. You know, it's not about that. It's what's inside. We'll deal with the other stuff later on. It's not about that. You should come to church looking for life. You see someone over there. Wow, look at this person. I want to say hi to them. Look at this person over here. Looks like they're kind of new. Looks like they're lost. They don't know what's going on. Let me go and bless them. We can come and give life, or we can give the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Come in here and criticize. I don't like those lights. (laughs) 
church should have a hymn book. There's no hymn books here. Okay, that's fine. It's a preference. Are you going to get all legalistic about it and try to find issues? Listen, if you want to find issues, I guarantee you none of us are perfect, and you're going to have all day and all night. You can make a list as long as the day is long. Or you can try to find life. Why not when you see somebody trying to find life? We went to a, uh, we went to a, a thing a number of years ago. It was a, um, some of you went with us. There was this thing where we were trying to Doma Law, uh, Defense of Marriage Act. They were trying to stop gay marriage way back when. And we went there, and, and, there, and there were these protesters on the other side of the Capitol. And I walked up to them. He says, you're, and I said, you know, we love you guys. And I started talking, I had a conversation with the guy. I, I don't know if he was a homosexual or what he was, but he was definitely for same-sex marriage. We just talked to the guy. He said, you know, we don't, we don't hate you. We just, hey, listen, we understand what you're doing. We just believe this is a better way for society, but, you know, God loves you. And you're, I'm no better than you. And I really believe that. And he was taken back. He's like, what? Hmm? Really? You're a Christian? Yeah, I'm a Christian. Then how come you're, I don't, we don't, I don't, listen, these other people that are holding signs, you're going to burn in hell and all that, that's not of God, okay? Now, now, am I saying that we all we need is love? No. The, the truth of the matter is there is a place called hell. There is. And the truth is, God doesn't send anyone to hell. We choose to go to hell by not following God because we're imperfect. And Jesus died on the cross for us to wash all our sins away. So that's what it's all about. And so it's about Jesus loves us so much, he wants us to have a better life. He wants you to have better health, better relationships. He wants you to have joy instead of sadness. Is that a bad deal? No, God wants the best for you, right? Well, how do I fall in love with God? When well, you think of what he's done for you and who he is, that's how you build love with God. And it may take time. Oh, I, don't, I don't pray very well. I can't understand the Bible. I keep falling asleep. Every time I close my eyes, I fall asleep. Don't close your eyes then. I thought, supposed to, I thought you were supposed to close your eyes when you pray. No, it's not wearing the Bible. You know, God loves you. Number two, don't let, first one is fall in love with Jesus, okay? Number two, don't allow condemnation. Romans 8, 1 through 2. There is therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of the life of Jesus Christ has made me free from the law of sin and death. Listen, when you make a mistake, God will always tell you, you are better than this. I believe in you. Come on, get up. You're better than this. And you might, come on, get up. You can do this. Well, come on, this is you're no good. You're baby, you're no good. You're terrible. You're not good enough to go to church. How dare you go to church and lift your hands? How dare you say you're a Christian? What kind of Christian are you? And that's, that's, that's the enemy. He takes the truth of God, and instead of truth, he takes, the, he takes truth out of it, takes the love out of truth, and when you take love out of truth, it becomes knowledge. And the knowledge can cut people up. God's always like, hey, there's a better way for you. If you're alive today, God's grace is here. If you're alive, God's grace is here. He doesn't want to damn you. He wants to save you. He really does. He really does. No condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. Yeah, there's a better way for you. Number three, make a choice every day. And here's the choice. Deuteronomy 30, 19. I call heaven and earth as a witness of today against you. I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Therefore, choose life that both of you and your descendants will live. Can we choose to live out of the tree of life instead of the tree, the religious tree of the knowledge of good and evil? Some of you, you gotta, you gotta stop this in your marriage. Well, you did this, and you did that. I mean, it's not fair to go in the past. You can't change the past, the past is the past. It's, it's, it's the most frustrating thing in the world. What would happen if God kept his past against you? We'd never have a chance. You have to let go of the past, realize this is the past, and move forward. Make a choice every day. Choose life, folks. Realize how much God has forgiven us. Now, I do have to say this this morning. Truth is, all of us are going to die unless Christ comes back. And all of us are going to have to face God one day. And if, if someone would say, why are you going to go to heaven? Well, I'm, I'm pretty good. I'm, compared to my neighbor, I'm pretty good. Compared to my spouse, I'm a lot better than my spouse. And they go to church, so I guess I'm going to go to heaven too. It isn't about that. It's not what you do, it's what's been done. 
And so all you can receive what Christ has done for you. The problem is none of us are perfect. None of us can face God. None of us can enter into heaven. There is a place called hell. And yes, there are fires of hell. That sounds judgmental. Listen, it's not judgmental. It's the truth. The Bible says it's like fire. May it, not, it may not be literal fire, but the most painful thing you can think of is fire that's a burning, an unquenchable fire. God loves us. Man's trajectory is to hell. God came to save us. Why do we call it good news? Because it's good news to get out of that area. See, God doesn't just want to save you from hell. He wants to give you life now and life forevermore. It only happens through Jesus Christ. You're not good enough. I'm not good enough. You can't pay for it. It's been paid for already. Receive it. It's that simple, folks. All you have to do is say, Lord, I'll give my life to you. I realize I'm wrong. I choose to stop trusting myself, and I trust in you. That's all you have to do. I give my life to you. So when you want to bow your head, we're just going to pray right now. If you'll pray this prayer, today can be the brand new day for you. Lord Jesus, I thank you for dying on the cross for me. I believe you are the Son of God. I receive the forgiveness of my sins. I ask you to forgive me of all of my sins, both past, all the things I did in the past, and even today. And I thank you, even in the future, I can call upon you to forgive me. I receive your forgiveness. I thank you that you love me and you have good plans for my life. I choose to trust you. I give you my heart today in Jesus' name. With every head bowed, you say, Pastor, I prayed that prayer. See, quick show of hands, real quick. Pastor, I prayed that prayer today. Thank you. Anyone else? Pastor, I prayed that prayer today. Thank you. Anyone else? Come on, you're being bold today. Let's make a change. Let's make a stand for God. Anyone else? Say, Pastor, I prayed that prayer. Thank you. Okay, let's, um, now I want to encourage you to participate in communion. Because now you gave your life to Christ, you can do this. Jesus came. This is my body which has been broken for you. Jesus came because we have a broken world. He, broke, he came, came broken for us emotionally so we could be fi fulfilled. He was a sacrifice to pay for our sins. Take, all of you eat. This is my body, which has been broken for you. What washes us from all the sin of our lives? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is the payment of all. It washes us everything. I want to encourage you today. The Bible says if you do not discern the body of Christ rightly, some of you drink condemnation on yourself. Pastor, I thought you were about grace. Yeah, there is grace. But God has forgiven you, so you ought to forgive each other. If you're not willing to forgive somebody, don't, don't do this today. Don't finish this out. Because everything about Christianity is about what Christ has done for us and how he's forgiven us. We ought to forgive each other. You don't forgive each other and you keep condemnation. What you're doing is you're eating out of the tree the knowledge of good and evil and you'll die. But if you want to live in life, choose to forgive. Choose to go forward. Take, drink. This is my body. Let's all stand if we could. And let's just sing that last song. I give all to you. As we do that, I'm going to ask the um, prayer team to make their way up. You want prayer for anything at all. And if you prayed that prayer today, I'm going to ask you to fill out this card. It says, I made a decision today. You can give it to one of the ushers or give it to one of the people up front or put it in one of the boxes. We'll get back to you. Thank you. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May He shine His face upon you and give you grace. Let's be a church that walks in the tree of life and not in the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. God bless you guys. If you want prayer, come forward. We invite you to come to the class. We have a few extra spots today. If you want to find out about Cornerstone Church, otherwise we dismiss you. These folks, these wonderful people up here to pray with you. We stand together, all needing God. God bless you.